Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's County Councillor Michael Harrison. I'm the chair of this, this board. This is a meeting of the North Yorkshire Health and Wellbeing Board. Just one uh, minor housekeeping item to mention at the, at the start that um, the majority of County Council meetings at the moment are classed as informal meetings still operating under emergency powers. If we had to take a decision, technically it would be the chief executive that would take it. I, I don't think that uh, particularly applies to us today because there's no formal decisions to take. So uh, welcome to the uh, members of the board and any members of the public or media who might be uh, viewing this meeting online. For the benefit uh, of members of the public or the media, this is a statutory committee whose main role is to act as a forum for leaders from the local health and care system to work together to improve the health and well-being of the local population. Membership of the board, you can see on the council's website. So I'm not going to ask everyone to introduce themselves now, but uh, certainly feel free to do so, please, members, uh, when you speak for, for the first time. Um, and I, I would acknowledge that over the course of the pandemic, we have met less frequently, you know, certainly during the last couple of years. And whilst, as we'll no doubt discuss today, uh, we're still living with COVID. Um, but as things start to turn back to some kind of normal normality, we, we will uh, now revert to a more regular meeting of, of this board. So with, with that in mind, um, if we can uh, just go to Item two on the agenda is minutes of the meeting held on 15th of September 2021. Unless somebody tells me otherwise, can I approve these as a, an accurate record? I see uh, no dissent to that, so we'll take that as given. And then item three, apologies for absence. I'll hand over to Patrick. Patrick, what apologies do we have? Thank you, Chair. There is apologies from Stuart Carlton, Richard Flinson, Councillor Richard Foster, Helen Hurst, Steve Russell, and also from Phil Metham and Brent Kilmurray, for whom Fiona Bell Morritt and Thomas Hurst, respectively, are substituting. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Uh, item four on the agenda, a uh, standard item here, if there is any declarations of interest to note. If there are any, shout up now. And uh, item five, public questions or statements. I'm not aware of any. Patrick, has any been received? That's right. None received, Chair. Thank you. OK, no problem at all. OK, we'll get into the um, substantive part of the agenda then. Uh, agenda item six, we've got three parts to this. The first, uh, I'm going to hand over to Louise Wallace, who is our Director of Public Health to um, cover the annual report. Over to you, Louise. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Um, can you see my slides coming through? Yes. Great, I'm just going to go on to slideshow. So just um, bear with me. That means um, I can't see hands going up. So um, I will just take you through the slides and then maybe come to questions at the end. Um, so uh, many people on the call have probably already seen this report because it was um, published back in December. It is a, a statutory duty of mine to produce a Director of Public Health annual report into the health status of the population and to reflect on uh, work that had gone on in the previous year. So this report covers uh, largely the year of 2020 to 2021, um, which means that I'm now about to start uh, drafting the 21-22 report. So if you just, when I'm um, listening to the slides and reading the report, keep in, in, in sight that time scale um, and as to why it only takes us to um, that April 2021 date, um, but I am on with writing um, the, the next iteration of this year's. Um, but of course, therefore, the main story in the uh, 2020 to 2021 year was, of course, our pandemic response. Um, but what this presentation is going to do is just take, quickly take you through some of the highlights in the report, um, because we do need to look back at past recommendations and priorities, which were set out um, by uh, Dr Lincoln Sargent in his annual report, uh, last annual report before he left North Yorkshire, and um, do always reflect on the health of the population. The report is about the health status and what we're doing in terms of priorities and uh, action and trying to address any issues that we've identified. And because overarchingly, the job is uh, for me to protect and improve the health of the population of the whole of uh, the people of North Yorkshire. I have set some priorities out for the next for a few years, up to 2025, but of course I'll report back on 
those priorities is, as I say, in the next iteration of the annual report for 21-22. So here we are in terms of past recommendations. I won't go through all of this um, because this detail is in the annual report, but just to recognise the recommendations that um, Lincoln had made in his annual report in 2019 and some actions and activities, and this is not an exhaustive or an exclusive list, um, but just some activities and services and initiatives that we have put in place and to address those recommendations that Lincoln left in his previous report. Um, as I said, just a snapshot, not necessarily a comprehensive list, but just to acknowledge um, when you know the Director of Public Health recommendations are made, um, you know, it's, it, it is expected that we take action and work together across all partner agencies to address those issues that have been identified. Um, but just in terms of North Yorkshire, our health generally is, is pretty good. Um, however, we do obviously have areas where our life expectancy is, is shorter in certain parts of the county than others. And of course, it's not just about the length of life that we live, but the quality of life um, that we experience, which is why we're really minded to look at um, not just across the county, but um, areas within the county and understand um, what the health status is. And we've obviously had uh, a recent visit people may have seen um, last week from our chief medical officer, uh, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, who came and talked to us about his annual report, which was focused on coastal communities. And so that's just an illustration, I think, of how we try to look at the needs of the whole county, our coast, our moors, our dales, our market towns, our communities, and try and understand the need. But if we look at the overarching indicator on life expectancy, we do see an element of variation across the county. So then just in terms of an unprecedented year, it's probably quite a well-used phrase, really, but I think um, 2020 to 2021 was um, quite unprecedented, obviously, because of the pandemic. And what we tried to do in the report is just I'll put out some key timelines, really, and some milestones of um, the issues that I think we were dealing with at various points in time, just to kind of plot the year. Um, clearly, this was a whole community, whole um, partner agency response to the pandemic. And of course, we are learning to kind of live with COVID and trying to live safely with COVID. So the pandemic continues, but we have moved on, on obviously, now into another uh, phase. Um, my 2021 to 22 report will pick up because um, you can see here it ends kind of in February 21, it will pick up the rest of the story. So there will be, I should imagine, a large uh, reflection still on COVID in the next report, but um, perhaps looking at the wider impact of uh, the, the virus across uh, communities in North Yorkshire. Um, and then in terms of the, the rest of the report, I do try to just pick out some of the key points uh, within in the report around pandemic response, not least around um, uh, testing, which of course for North Yorkshire Given our community and our geography, we wanted to make sure we not only had fixed sites, but mobile testing sites, as well as access to our own testing capability. And um, clearly worked in partnerships, uh, partnership, strong partnership with our colleagues in the NHS around um, responding uh, to outbreaks within care settings and continue to do so. And of course, um, just looking at how we how we uh, rolled out the, the vaccination programme, of course, Amanda Blore, who was Senior Responsible Officer for the vaccine rollout, um, might want to say more on that point, but just a uh, a big uh, game changer, I think, in terms of having the vaccination programme. But this is just how to highlight a little bit of the kind of priority areas that we've been working on across um, the whole of the pandemic in that year that this report covers. Um, and then in terms of partnerships, I think one of the things I would reflect um, from a pandemic response point of view is, of course, um, it has been incredibly difficult, I think, for many people and for our communities, um, but people have pulled together and have worked in partnership. And we'll do, hopefully, in the weeks and the months to come as we um, move on and learn to live with COVID pandemic. Um, but just to think about the, the, the response that people gave, the support, you know, uh, shopping being delivered, meals being delivered, uh, transport requests, trying to keep people um, safe, um, befriending calls, prescriptions delivered. All of that required people to come together and really work in partnership uh, with each other. So I um, just wanted to reflect on that and, and do that in a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a, um, a positive but also reflective um, mode because, uh, you know, behind every statistic was probably a person who absolutely needed support at a point in time when it was incredibly difficult for them. So just to acknowledge that. Um, and then in terms of the rest of the, the report, clearly we were dealing with the pandemic response, but we do, did and have had other public health priorities that we've been um, working to address, not least our work around healthy weight, healthy lives, our work around sexual health services, and not to 19 work with um, Harrogate District Foundation Trust around the best start in life and making sure that um, we, we kept our services 
open and able to deliver services, not, not least if they were done in a different way and obviously using digital technology, perhaps more than what we had done before the pandemic. But just a bit of a recognition there that whilst we were responding to the pandemic, we were also trying to keep um, some much needed services operating, um, albeit perhaps in a, a slightly different form to the one that we were used to before the pandemic and the use of digital technology has been key in that. Um, but in terms of the priorities then and looking to the future, they're much the same as I think they were before the pandemic around wanting to make sure that everybody does have the best opportunity to live a long and healthy and independent life across the county and to think about that life expectancy. But most importantly for me, the quality of life lived as well. You know, the experience that people have of, of well-being across the county and be it physical, mental and health and emotional well-being. So priorities for this um well, for the next few years, um, but I will go into more detail on each in the next iterations of the annual report going forward. And that issue around having equality and having healthy play shaping. We've got some fantastic assets around the county, um, a beautiful county with, lo with lots of natural assets that can help to, you know, keep people healthy and well. Um, just walking along the coast, walking along the moors, getting out there and enjoying um, the fresh air is a really important part of kind of keeping healthy and well. Um, but also looking at those issues around economic determinants, housing, employment, education, which we know have an impact on keeping um, on maintaining health and well-being. Um, protecting the health population, me and my team and Dr Victoria Turner, headed up by Dr Victoria Turner, will continue to keep a real focus on protecting the health population. And that includes uh, responding to COVID-19, but other things around protecting health, making sure we work closely with the UK Health Security Agency, and because this is a key statutory duty for us mental health and well-being, making sure that we, um, you know, try and understand the need across the population, working in partnership with colleagues in the NHS and the community and voluntary sector um, to make sure that we give that priority of esteem to our mental health and well-being as well as our physical health. And ensuring our babies and children and our young people get that best start in life, get the opportunity to, to really thrive and get education, a, a good education, and that hopefully helps them to get good jobs and want to stay and work and be part of our North Yorkshire community. Um, in, in the years to come. Working age population, opportunities to live well, and, and of course, ageing well, and making sure that, um, you know, we do have perhaps in some parts of the county uh, more older people than other parts of the country, and ageing well in North Yorkshire is really important um, for us to recognise again the different needs of the different parts of the population groups and what we can do to support that. Um, working really closely with our NHS colleagues, um, one of the uh, I think real benefits of the pandemic is the partnership pace we have. And we did work well before the pandemic, um, but it really has given us an opportunity to, to really come back together and work really well together. And I know Amanda will say more about our future integrated care system um, arrangements that are emerging and developing as we speak. But that real partnership with NHS colleagues is key to um, uh, population health care and making sure that we've got good health outcomes and we try to understand equality and inequality around service provision. And then I've got um, the team a really kind of ambition around the Centre for Public Health Excellence um, in Research, Training and Behaviour Science. So partnering with our academic institutions and um, thinking about how we translate uh, good academic and research and the science of public health into something tangible and deliverable and evidence based interventions for uh, the county. So that um, real focus on um, Centre of Excellence is quite an exciting um, opportunity here. It's early days. Um, but I think it's one that we'll be really keen to look at because we should really always evaluate and try and understand um, the impact, um, not least from value for money point of view, but uh, importantly, the impact that it made in terms of the lives that people are living in North Yorkshire and the um, evidence-based interventions that we recommend and advice that we give. Um, there are some words that uh, have come through from one of those word Moodles, where I think they're called Moodles, are they? Where people kind of put in what they think are the priorities. That just gives you a bit of a sense of the things, the breadth and depth of issues that we'll be covering. So not just about, um, you know, the kind of risk-taking behaviour and how we might keep ourselves healthy and well, but how we do protect the health population and, of course, make sure we've got good healthcare public health as well. Um, and that's that's it, um, Chair. I'll stop sharing slides. Um, I suspect most people will have already seen the Public Health Annual Report before today because, as I say, it was published back in December. But, um, you know, happy to take any any questions. Thank, thanks, Louise. Just, just while I wait for um, people to put their hands up, just uh, reflecting on what a, what a year it must have been to be a director of uh, public health, and I suppose it, at national as well as regional and local level, um, there's uh, names and faces that are more um, recognisable now than maybe maybe public health had um, previously. Just one thing I wanted to ask you about. I mean, 
it, it's it, it's very real when we talk about life expectancy and we see the differences locally because um, you know you can often compare them across countries and that seems very very remote but when we're talking places in this county where on average you're going to live less uh, or you're certainly going to live healthier for a, a, a lesser period of time specifically um you know what kind of things do you see as being the the key to try and address those in 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 the areas that are really lagging behind in in the county yeah, so it's, it's multifactorial, um, Chair, as you can imagine. Um, so we do need to consider not just the things that we can do to keep ourselves healthy and well, so that uh, keeping physically active, thinking about, uh, you know, keeping a healthy weight, healthy life, the things that we can personally do, but also those wider issues around employment, education, housing, all of the circumstances with which we live um, do make a contribution to our health and, and well-being. And of course, access to good, high quality health services does make a contribution to our well-being. So it's very multifactorial. I think our data and our intelligence tells us where those inequalities are. So we see them in coastal communities. That is the case in terms of the data and borne out with the data in Scarborough and uh, other parts of the county. Perhaps then Selby also has, um, uh, you know, data that tells us that uh, if people live less healthy for longer um, than perhaps other parts of the wider parts of the county. But it is very multifactorial, which is why it's never one single answer. And that's why the Director of Public Health Report thinks about protecting the health population, improving the health population through working in partnership with others and thinking about the wider determinants of health, as well as um, health protection being really key. So dealing with non-communicable diseases around cardiovascular disease, et cetera, et cetera, and primary and secondary intervention. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Um, Richard, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you, uh, Louise, for a really, really good uh, sort of tour of the whole scene, really, uh, in terms of all the issues. Um, and I thought it was something really interesting, so following up to that question about life expectancy. We often talk about pure life expectancy, don't we? But I think something I heard you say just then was about, it's not just about that, it's also about years of healthy life lived. So actually, if we particularly think about the impact on uh, people's sense of well-being and also monetarily on the impact on public services you know I think in in parts of Scarborough you have healthy life until you're in the mid 50s in hot and rugby it's mid 70s you know there's 20 we often hear about that in big cities but in terms of healthy years live that's a big gap and that means people are much more likely to come into health and social care and other public services won't be able to work at, at, perhaps in the same way uh, at a much earlier age so and there are practical things we can do to address that which is um, really important okay. thank you uh, any other contributors please raise your hands if not okay great louise thank you very much for for that um and uh, we'll move on now to um the next item uh, as part of this agenda item which is uh, health watch north yorkshire i'm going to hand over to um, ashley green who is the chief executive officer and uh, Actually, I know these slides were um, circulated with the agenda, but uh, I think we're going to see them on the screen as well. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, if that's OK. OK, we can see your screen now. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I can't see it. Oh yes, I can see it. <laughs> so, so first of all, yeah, thank you, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity actually to um, talk to you um, today. And I'm, I mean, many people will will know myself and know what and know what we do. But I thought it, was, it is nice though, and a good opportunity for me just to give a, a bit of a flavour about who we are and and the work that we do. Um, so, so thank you very much. It's very, very much of a whistle stop tour really of, of our work. So, first slide. It's very much really so who you know who who are we so we are um obviously the, the health and care champion for the the county of north yorkshire and we were established under the health and social care act for 2012. so our, our main focus is very much around representing the views of the local population and their experiences of health and social care so whether they are good experiences or whether they are whether they are bad experiences 
Um, and they're just some contests. There's 151 local health watch, so across all of England. And they very much work with their local partners, so with the CCGs, the local authorities, the local trusts. And then there's a National Health Watch, um, Health Watch England, who then works very much with, you know, with, with government and NHS England. So we are an independent charity. So we're a charitable incorporated organisation, which means we're regulated by the Charity Commission. And we're commissioned by North Yorkshire County Council. So North Yorkshire County Council receive um, uh, so a, f a funded grant from central government and they themselves then commission um, their local health watch. And our approach is really very much around, um, you know, working together and in partnership and su supporting the, those sort of partners. So very much acting as that cr critical friend. Um, and that for itself is really, really um, in in important. So in a nutshell, what is it that we do? So we do three main things, really. So we, the key thing is very much around listening to people about the types of services that they receive, their feedback and their insight from them. So they're very much around information gathering. So how do we do that? We, you know, we undertake a number of, of surveys, we do focus groups, we talk with local communities. So really good now that we can start to get out and about across North Yorkshire. We are linked in with the Community Volunteer Centre networks. We hear from people through our emails, through our website and through our phone calls. Um, and again, very much then working with our partners. So, for example, people like the Selby AVS, Craven Communities Together, working with the local trusts and, and the CCGs. So really, really trying to spread our wings as far as possible across the um, county to hear from as many people um, as possible. And over the last year, we've probably heard from around 2,000 people, which is, I think, a really a real achievement um, for such a small team. And just a, just a reflection on ourselves. So there is myself, um, and then I've got four other team members. So it's a very small um, um, organisation. So then what do we do with that information then that, that we've, we've gathered? And that's really one of the key points, is then to share with our partners to try and shape and influence services. So we produce um, from that information um, reports. So we have a, a quarterly report we call our Pulse Report, and that provides that sort of snapshot of the types of issues and concerns that people are facing um, across North Yorkshire. I think our last one we produced uh, actually only last month, and there was a specific focus around mental health um, within that. We produce a more focused report. So we've done where we do piece of work, which I'll go on to later. We produced a report in January around the work we've done around care homes. Um, but we also produce smaller sort of briefings, which give again give a snapshot of the information that, that we're hearing. And it's very much around providing the information that, that, that trusts and commissioners and providers um, need and actually to help them with with developing and or defining or updating any sort of information and we have a, a monthly what we call a monthly action log where again we share with local trusts about any concerns that we're hearing and again we get really good feedback from them and they come back to us and tell us what they've done as a result of the information that we provided them with so again very much that partnership um, approach and the third thing we do is then is, is then helping people um, with the information that they need to, to access the, the types of services. So again, we have our, our website, which we probably have about 5,000 visits um, per month. We have a printed newsletter that we, we've started over the last year, and that was distributed to over 4,000 people. So again, across uh, North Yorkshire, so by GP practices and, and by libraries, we do like an e-newsletter, um, and then we, we have our, our volunteer network who, to talk to people, and again, through our um, people ringing, ringing us and, and emailing us. So they're really the three key things that, that we do um, as a as a charity. And then what are the um, I suppose some of the, the, the priorities that we that we've undertook over the, um, the the last year? And they very they actually very much tie in with some of the concerns and the issues that Louise raised in her last presentation around some of the priorities um, you know, for the county and for people's health. Um, and these were really around so improving services and quality uh, with the care home sector. So again, working very close with people like you know, Richard Webb and, and the, the County Council. Um, so for this, we undertook a piece of work to actually understand how the care sector actually innovated and developed during the pandemic and as a result of the pandemic. So actually a really, really positive piece of work. And we found that there was real innovation 
um, within the sector and how they wanted to ensure that the, their, their residents and the people they were looking after were were supported. Um, and that was, you know, that was a really good piece of work. And actually, the, the, the sector found that really, really helpful, which is, again, really, really important. A big issue for us, which I will talk about later, is very much around the access to um, NHS dentistry. I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but it's a real, it's not only actually an issue first in North Yorkshire, but it's a real national issue, the, the lack of uh, NHS dentist, dentistry. So that, again, was a priority um, for us. And then kind of trying to reduce the gap around health inequalities, and we specifically targeted um, SCARB and Selby. So looking at the data from the JSNA and looking at health inequalities, they were the two, particularly SCARB, that really stood out around um, you know, issues of, of, of health and, and mortality. So that's been very much around working collaboratively with, with the primary care networks, the CCGs, NHS, the CVS, to see where we could bring patient insights um, to help improve services. So we've un undertaken focus groups you know, across Scarborough, again, working in partnership with the local um, sector there. Um, and we're currently undertaking some, some focus groups in, in, in Craven um, and, and in Selby. Um, and for example, we're part of things like Selby Healthy Matters, um, do some work around the um, urgent treatment centre in, in Selby, and we're part of the sort of Scarborough and Rydale partnership group. So again, very much that sort of partnership um, approach. And so something that actually health watchers don't regularly hear about actually is, is from, from younger people. So we wanted to really um, I suppose improve that and actually and get out and hear from younger people. Um, so we've actually been making um, connections, started to work with colleges um, across Scarborough, Selby and Craven, and actually come to university um, in Scarborough. And we're just undertaking a mental health um, survey with younger people because we, we're aware that actually the pandemic had a real effect on, uh, on, on, on younger people. So that's a piece of work that will continue. And then very much then trying to um, support the all systems really around uh, information to around the um, COVID-19 um, recovery. And we produced a number of specific reports um, about, around COVID-19, again, that we've shared with our, um, our stakeholders. And just to give you a flavor, I think of some of the topics that we've been um, hearing about, um, so you see <laughs> dentistry is very prominent there. Um, I think like access to GP services. Um, so the dentistry is very much around that actually people can't register with an NHS dentist. Um, they've been forced to go privately and um, to pay, which has had a real impact on, on, on people's ability to pay, but also ability to access dentistry. There's been issues around children's oral health, again, because they haven't been able to go to the dentist and actually overall impacts around um, well-being. Um, access to GP services has very much been around, I think really just really access to booking appointments and, and accessing appointments. Um, and again, there's been a mixed feedback around some people have really benefited and, 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 and been held by online consultations, but others have found that um, quite, quite, quite difficult. Um, hospital care has been very much around and really caused by the pandemic, there's sort of delays to um, treatment and issues around poor quality of care. Um, but a caveat really is that obviously Health Watch, we tend to hear about <laughs> negative things that are happening, but we, but we do know there are lots of really positive things happening um, across the sector um, as well. But hopefully that just gives you a bit of an idea about what we're hearing about. We heard a lot around the, the COVID vaccination programme initially from people just really interested and wanted to know what, where it was happening and, and how they could um, you know, get vaccinated. And um, so there was a real um, there was appetite for information um, around that. So these are our, I suppose, our current activities and the work that we've, we've been undertaking um, 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 at, at the moment. So we're currently working um, actually collaboratively with North Yorkshire County Council to undertake a piece of work to understand the needs of um, the registered managers across the adult um, care settings. So trying to understand things like um, training and support. So very much around supporting the whole workforce um, de development, which is obviously uh, um, key to all of us, really. And showing we have the, the have right and skilled and enough enough people um, supporting the um, patients and the public. And again, we um, the ICG are part of the working group we're doing with this. So we'll be undertaking surveys and focus groups, and we'll be producing a, a report um, in June um, around that. People's experiences of dentistry. So this really um, complements the work we've, we've done earlier. But um, 
but what we wanted to actually look at was rather than just actually, I suppose, the, the initial the, the concerns and issues around access to dentistry, how was actually, what were the secondary effects around um, dentistry? Um, so, so particularly consequences around mental health, around employment, around isolation, or poverty. Um, and we'll be, we actually will be producing a report in the next month, but we've heard some real, first of all, horror stories actually, people actually pulling out the, their, their own teeth, people's relationships being affected because, because, of, because of their teeth, people not going for interviews, um, uh, you know, again, because of, because of their oral, oral hygiene. Um, and actually, young and, and families, um, you know, again, not being able to take their their younger children to um, dentists because they've got their best aunt and just dentists around. So it's actually it's a, it's a real it's a real issue, um, um, and just dentistry. So that we're also looking at and this is part of a wider Health Watch England um, piece of work, which is around um, access, accessible information provision. So again, we're working with Health Watch um, York and with North Yorkshire County Council to review people's access to accessible information. Um, I mean, there is obviously there's an accessible information standard that came into law in 2016, but again, there's a real variation in the types of information that is provided um, across all areas, really. So we want to really undertake a bit of a re review with this, but again, it's that very much partnership approach, get a feeling and understanding of what information is out there and how, and how people benefit from that, and then maybe look at some action plans to work over the next 12 months or 18 months to sort of support you know, providers um, with this. Um, we're, again, we're working with partners to really to, to raise awareness actually um, amongst the communities around primary care services. Um, and we hear a lot about um, a real, well, people's desires to actually to want to talk to their, their GP. But actually, we know that the GP practice and the surgeons offer a lot wider services rather than just their GP. So around, you know, their mental health workers, their social prescribers, pharmacists, dentists. Um, so we really want to try and get that information out to to the public to actually, as opposed to, as opposed to, to reduce the burden and 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 and, and the demand on the GPs, um, but also provide information around that people can contact them, you know, um, online using the NHS app, for, for, for example. So again, we want to work in partnership with with uh, with our um, partners uh, um, around that. As I mentioned, we're doing some work with with colleges and with students around young people's mental health, um, and we'll, we're undertaking a survey at the moment. And we'll, our aim is to produce a report um, which will come out in, in in May, which will be part of the Mental Health um, Awareness Week. So again, we'll, I'll make sure I share all this information um, with with yourselves and with the board. Um, and finally, again, we want to um, make sure we're having consultations and, and, and talking to, to people across areas, particularly you know, Selby, Craven and, and, in, and in Scarborough, to actually hear their experiences. So we're currently undertaking, um, undertaking sorry, surveys in, in those two areas. And I wanted to give you a bit of an example, um, I suppose, of, of, a, of the case study of work that we've we've been doing, um, and particularly around actually dentistry, because I mentioned this is a real concern, and it's and really for the past year, um, it's it's always been in, in the top three um, issues that, that we're hearing about from the um, public, um, and these are some of the concerns really. So access, first of all, to an NHS dentist is is, is more or less impossible. Um, I mean, these figures are probably about, uh, about six months old now, but, but during the time we did the report, which came out in August, you'll see that, that picture there, we heard from 200 people. And actually the pandemic really exacerbated a, 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 a already fragile system. And you'll probably be aware that actually, that because of, you know, because of um, the PPE and, and restrictions around, around the, the pandemic, um, I think access to, to dentists went, went down to about, about 40 percent um, people. So there's a real backlog um, of, of people. Um, and, and actually what, what was also what's happened, actually, because of the pandemic, people then weren't going to their NHS dentist when they then rang up 18 months or a year later to try and then um, go and see them. They were then told that they're being removed from, from, from their practice because they hadn't been for over a year um, and then were then left, basically. Um, um, people have, 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 you know, have been had to have been pushed to go private, and at a real huge cost. If you think of trying to um, cover costs for a, a whole family, um, and actually, it's meant that actually people haven't actually gone to the dentist um, full stop. So it's been a real issue. And part of the work that we undertook for the the report 
was to understand about I suppose the, the situation out there and, and at the time of the report so probably over you know over six to nine months ago now um, there were 77 NHS dentists across North Yorkshire um, which equates to about one dentist per 8,000 people which you can see really is it isn't enough and out of those 77 NHS dentists only two at that particular time were taking on on new patients but actually there were quite there were, but there were restrictions in those people. So I think it was around people who, um, so mothers who were who were pregnant and maybe children. But there were really, really quite quite stringent um, restrictions there. Um, and many people have we spoke to um, have been waiting for over some people over over three years to access NHS dentists, and some waiting lists were over a thousand people. And actually, men dentists actually didn't even give, weren't, didn't allow people to actually have um, a waiting list at all. So a real um, issue there. So it's a bit, a bit of doom and gloom. So sorry about that. Um, but what was our impact really in the work that we've done? Um, and again, this is really important to Health Watch because actually it's, it's fine doing lots of reports and, and talking to people. But actually, what we want to ensure is there is a, you know, there, there is an impact in the work that we do. Um, so we actually we had a real increase in a lot of media um, coverage, so BBC Radio York, local media, local radio stations, so really actually raising the profile um, of of them the dentistry, um, and that's and which again made more people come to us and and, and share their, their views with us. A part of one of the actually the recommendations we had in the report is that we wanted to ensure that people were more involved and had a say in in their own um, dental health care. Um, and I think, I think as a consequence of our report and of the media work, uh, we were then invited by NHS England to be part um, of, of new, in, of new um, procurement uh, um, processes for new services across North Yorkshire, so for Helmsley and in Scarborough, Robin Hood's Bay. Um, so very much involved in the procurement panels and reviewing patient engagement and, and patient accessibility. So that's been a real plus that we're now part of, of that whole new procurement process. Part of what Health Watch do is very much work in collaboration with you know, with other local health watchers. So again, within West Yorkshire, so you think a, a year ago, a year ago, Harrogate was and Craven were part of the West Yorkshire um, RCS. So we worked together with the Leeds Health Watch and Bradford and Kirklees, for example, and we lobbied very hard for the West Yorkshire Healthcare Partnership at, at the time to have um, a specific working group around um, dentistry. And, and because of I suppose, the feedback that we presented to them, they agreed to that. So there's now an established working group looking at access um, to dentistry. On a, on a national level, what we did as local health watchers across England, we fed lots of the, the insight and the issues and the concerns to Health Watch England, who then again then spoke with um, NHS England and, and the government. And, and actually, I think earlier, the end of last year, earlier this year, the government then um, made available £50 million pounds of extra funding to, to support um, NHS den dentistry. Um, I think it's to, 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 to support the access because, the, because of the pandemic, but also to, to, to really help with, with the backlog um, around that. And I, think, and I don't think there's been an injection of money since, uh, really, I think, I think since the, the actual the government funded um, funding started around the national contract in 2006. So again, um, those of I think of, you know I think we, we were really really positive from Health Watch England that this, that this really happened. So that was really really good. Um, we provide our reports to people like the Health and Scrutiny Board, um, and again we're working in partnership with the Health Watchers in the Humber Coast of Vale region. So so Hull, East Riding, and York. And again we've we've just helped to hopefully influence a lobby for a new group that has just started actually the first meeting this week. So again, part of Humber and, and Yorkshire, um, looking at uh, dental access to um, patients. Um, and, and from April, I think um, next year, so April 2023, the expectation then is the, the integrated care systems will then take on the commissioning for dentistry. So I hope these both works within West Yorkshire and Humber Coast of Vale, we can really um, really help you know, with, with the, the commissioners and the providers to really understand some of the issue, issues facing um, the local um, population. Um, so, 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 some positive things again. Some of the the issues, um, and that's yeah, that's it. So, thank you very much. And uh, any, uh, any any questions?
Thank, thanks, actually. Thanks, open it up to the um, to the board for questions. I, I just just while we're just waiting to see if anyone hands goes up. Your feedback slide. It, it did occur to me that I'm, I'm guessing that unsolicited feedback will presumably be almost entirely negative by its by its very nature. I'm, I'm guessing you don't get a lot of people contacting Health Watch unless you've asked um, to tell their good news stories. But I. But I'm also thinking that, but that that doesn't matter in a sense. If if you use dentistry as an example, that mm. the level of feedback is prompting you looking at something that's a that is a real issue for for people. Yeah, I mean, I know. I mean, th thank you, um, Michael. I mean, it, it is a it is a balance. But I mean, we do, we do hear actually we do hear good good news stories from from care that they, people have had in in, in hospitals um, as well. Um, but but it's also balanced between us being proactive and going out into the communities and 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 finding out from people what they they're hearing. But yeah, the majority is it is always negative, which I, I tell myself <laughs> I have to remind myself and my team that actually there's lots of good things happening, and we don't want to be you know doom and gloom all you know all the time. But where there are issues, and but the good thing is you know and, and I, I really want to praise the people on. On this call to on this call today because we get we work really really closely and well with our partners and, and they do they do take on board a lot of the information that, 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 that we um with the, we, we provide them but we also similarly we try because you know it's very easy isn't it just to just do sort of you know bash gps and that type of thing but also when we do talk to the public we, we we do explain the good things that are happening and the innovations that are happening uh, um, across primary care so it's, it's always um a challenge for us really yeah okay thank you right i'll bring in some uh, uh, questions so sean your hand was up first yeah thank you uh, michael and uh, thank you very much ashley it's sean jones from nhs england and as the current commissioner of dental services it would be remiss of me not to comment on <laughs> on your report i think it's fair to say um i think um first of all very helpful informative presentation and really good insight in terms of the work that you do and have done over North, over North Yorkshire the last year or two. So thank you very much. And clearly there's a lot of stuff in there, but just particularly coming to the report about dentistry, clearly it's very challenging context that you described. They're not unique to North Yorkshire, I think it's fair to say. And the restrictions around access, PPE use and capacity have only recently been anywhere nearer to 100% now. So there's a real legacy and backlog there that started to work through coupled with the procurement process and the complexity of the contracts and so on, have all compounded the situation. And, uh, and from a health inequalities point of view, mindful of Louise's early report, it is going to be a legacy that we're going to have to keep a close eye on for some years to come. But I think what I would say, actually, in amongst all of that and the, and the difficulties that, that no, people have been experiencing, I think the examples that you gave there around how you got involved in the Helmsley and Scarborough pieces of work and working through some flexible re procurement process and trying to tailor some of that to the local context is, is a good example of Healthwatch working closely and trying to proactively address some of the challenges that we experience. So I think just a feedback to yourself and, and your colleagues around the work that you've been involved in and hopefully the arrangements that have been put in place there will help address some of those significant gaps in those two areas and we can take the learning from that to try and replicate in other parts of the region as well. So thank, thank you Ashley. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Richard, your hand is up next. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to thank you for the presentation. And, and actually, I think it's really nice to see, I think, over the last uh, couple of years, how uh, Health Watch has developed. And I think also adding some real value on some issues that often um, taking different, you know, different approaches to, to issues that might be familiar and also shining a light on perhaps some areas and services that don't always get attention, but are often really vital to people. So, uh, really grateful for that and actually being willing to you know even if when there are points of disagreement between us all actually willing to have a conversation and think about that so um i'm particularly grateful for uh, some of the work on the care sector actually which didn't just go you know there's a, a very familiar easy narrative about crisis and everything that's wrong but actually what you did do is tell people stories about how they'd contributed to uh, the effort during the pandemic which i think was really important so thank you Great. Um, Amanda, you've got your hand up next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ashley, for the, the slides. It's really useful. Just a couple of points from me, really. Um, just firstly, relating to dentistry. Um, 
just such a challenge in terms of that service uh, and has been for a while really as Sean said it's currently commissioned by NHS England um, but the uh, commissioning and contracting of dentistry and other primary care services will move to the ICSs as you say from um, from April next year um, and actually we're just currently working through that and trying to understand the complexity of the contractual model so that we can respond to the population's needs around access to dentistry. So um, really helpful that the challenges and the, the stories and the experience of people comes to the fore so we can really learn from that in terms of shaping the services as we move forward. Um, and then secondly, just in relation to, to GP services, um, very close to my heart, having worked really closely, obviously, with a number of GPs in North Yorkshire for the last few years and taking on the portfolio across the ICS um, and the role of Health Watch in engaging with the, the, the wider public around understanding the challenges on services and, um, and how to best use primary care and how to respect um, and support primary care as well, because some of the behaviour we did see uh, was was not acceptable, um, and I think we're all we all recognise that. But actually, primary care has played a massive role uh, in keeping the population safe and in the vaccine programme over the last two years, and is really responding now to a new way of working, thinking about the ageing population with the long term condition management, but also the grow the growing numbers of urgent care that's now seen in primary care and picked up same day emergency care which is a different model to how we worked in the past and how colleagues worked in the past and um, so just to flag that I think that's a really helpful role that Health Watch are playing to just help that understanding and it comes back to Michael's point we don't often get proactive praise and thanks but acting as the interface to um, hear the stories, um, hear the, the experiences um, and reflect and learn from those is just really, really helpful. So thank you. Thank you. And Sally? Thank you. Um, I suppose I'm sat here as the primary care representative, um, obviously with a GP background, but mindful that there aren't any pharmacy, dental or optometry colleagues here. So um, I feel that I'm representing all of the, the wider primary care. I just wanted to firstly thank you. Um, I think it was a really interesting presentation, Ashley, and I think um, one of my reflections is that um, we are increasingly working closer together as primary care groups um, rather than in silos. So we've set up in North Yorkshire and York a primary care collaborative. Um, which includes GPs, dental, optometrists and pharmacists. So we're starting to look at ways that we can truly collaborate together so that we do things once. So that might involve GPs supporting patients um, with difficulty with dental care, but it might also involve dentists or pharmacists doing work that traditionally may have been done in GP um, surgeries. And I think that... Um, not not dismissing the, the huge challenges that we've heard about and that we're well aware in terms of access and workforce challenges for, for dental, but also pharmacy and uh, GP colleagues. I think there are real opportunities and it feels to me working in that sector as if for the first time there is a real wish on um, from all parts of the, the primary care sector to really work together and break down those barriers. And I think that can only be positive for um, our communities in the long run. And I think that I would hope that in the coming months there will be some really positive examples to share as to where that's worked really well. And I think um, my ref my other reflection is that you've obviously already been working quite closely with some um, some parts of the sector and primary care networks, I think we maybe need to look at how we can bring you in closer to that and possibly even invite you to one of our um, primary care collaborative meetings where you can update some of um, my colleagues, not just myself, on, on the work that you're able to do and, and the ways that you can support us to continue supporting um, the communities as best that we can. Thank you. Okay, yeah, no, th th thank you, Sally. No, I, I, I really appreciate it. I'd really, like to um, work more closely with you and that sounds really interesting around the primary care collaborative so yeah no I'd really welcome that thank you. Okay great thank you uh, and thanks very much Ashley for, for, for that presentation. Okay so uh, just the final part of this agenda item 6c is the North Yorkshire Safeguarding Adults Board annual report. Now normally we would we would have this 
uh, presented to us um, back in uh, back end of the year by the independent chair of the board. And um, because of our meeting structure this this year, we haven't done that. So we've circulated this report previously and asked if anyone had any queries to um, to go directly to the independent chair. Now, uh, as far as I'm aware, I, we haven't got any. What I would say to, to members, if you haven't read that report, I would strongly recommend you, you have a look at it, both the, the work of the, the uh, Safeguarding Children's Board and the Safeguarding Adults Board is absolutely crucial and um, some of the lessons that, that we learn as a system when, when things go wrong are absolutely the things that we need to be aware of. You know, we, we on, only have to look around the country when, you know, cases come, come to the fore. We see some terrible instances where potentially people have been let down by, um, you know, uh, whether it be individuals or, or by, by the system more generally. So if you haven't read that report, I would encourage you to, to do so. Um, I just offer anyone the opportunity to raise any issues if they have had a, a look just uh, just now. Richard, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree with you. I just wanted to say a couple of things, really. I think, first of all, thanks to uh, Sue Proctor as the independent uh, chair and all the members of the Safeguarding Board. I think actually this at the adult Safeguarding Adult Board and you know what it's been like for children. I think the pandemic has really helped. I think it's actually working remotely has meant we've had much greater participation, which has been uh, great because people haven't had to drive long distances. And we've done some, uh, I think, really interesting work there. I think the other thing I would say is just to draw people's attention probably to something that's changing and emerging. So I think we're seeing two issues now. There's the, the what might be described as the traditional sort of safeguarding work. So sort of uh, perhaps people who are... Uh, at a more frail stage of life and often older people or people with severe disabilities who might be receiving care services or, or NHS services. And then I think an increasing focus on people who are perhaps often quite marginalised in the community with very complex life circumstances, drug and alcohol issues, mental health, where actually the system is often you know, around the country often finds it quite difficult to engage with people. And those are the people who, I know, Michael, when we go through serious incidents, are often the people who increasingly are uh, highlighted to us. So it was just to make sort of make a note about that, really, for, for, for colleagues, that we're having that sort of twin track approach, really. Yeah, OK, thank you for that. Anything else anyone wants to say on that item? As I say, if you haven't seen the report, I would encourage you to have a look at it and you know if if time is of the essence there is a, an excellent executive summary that uh, uh, that gives you a good flavour. Okay right thank you we'll move on to agenda item seven which is an update on local government reorganisation and I'm handing back to you I think Richard. Yes thank you very much indeed hopefully you can see the slides yeah. here. Yeah, yep. and I'm going to do a bit of a, a double act with uh, Jana as the uh, Chief Exec of Selby District and also Assistant Chief Exec of uh, North Yorkshire. So I'm going to, we've agreed I'm going to do the slides, but I'll, I'll then bring in Janet at the end. So, <coughs> excuse me, three major organisations happening structurally, nationally and locally. So we've heard about, uh, we will, or we'll be hearing in a moment about the ICS changes to ICS uh, arrangements for North Yorkshire. Already, we've had changes around public health, so the end of Public Health England to be replaced by uh, the UK Health Security Agency and uh, the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, which happened uh, last autumn. Um, and then we've got local government reviews. So uh, just very briefly to give everyone an update on this. Um, so we had a decision by the Secretary of State uh, last July, um, and that was to create a single county-wide unitary. And the details here are on this web link, if people aren't familiar with them. We're bringing eight councils to merge into one, uh, which will be a new North Yorkshire Council. Um, and that will be in place from the 1st of April 2023. So not that long ahead, actually. And there's also parallel work uh, that's sort of iterative around a devol devolution deal for York and North Yorkshire, which will see an elected mayor and a combined authority put in place too. This is the timeline. Uh, covered some of that already. A key date coming up, which is the 5th of May, uh, where there'll be elections for uh, the new council and uh, that will look slightly different to usual so normally the terms are four years 
this will be a five-year term. So for the uh, first year, the, the new councillors will be uh, the last county councillors for North Yorkshire and the first sort of shadow councillors for the new council. And then uh, we'll have another election in 2027. Um, so we're now in a politically uh, restricted period. We've got uh, vesting day for the 1st of April. So a lot of what we're doing currently is about preparing what's described as transition, safe and legal work for day one. So if you can, you know, if your bin is emptied as usual, if you can get a library book, if you can go for a swim, and that all happens perfectly on the 1st of April, uh, that's a success. If, if those things don't happen, that's where we uh, could hit problems. So we're all working really hard to, to get that sort of everything norm, normal on, the, on day one. And obviously, we're picking up opportunities of how we can work together, how we can create efficiencies, how we can uh, deliver savings to um, some of those we can do in year. But the major bulk of that will be from day uh, two onwards. I won't go through this in a lot of detail, but obviously, clearly, there's an opportunity around uh, improving uh, how we work together and uh, greater efficiency. And I think particularly given the pressures that we see on public service at the moment, the cost of living pressures on the public, uh, and also you know, the impact of things like the war in Ukraine, uh, we know that we need to uh, continue to make savings and efficiencies to ensure services are sustainable over the next five to 10 years. So that's an important reason for, for this change. I think one of the things we'll see in the new council is that it will be both you know, big enough to have an impact uh, in terms of funding and uh, you know, being a strong voice for North Yorkshire nationally, uh, but also it will be very local and it will feel um, even more lo local perhaps than, than some of the arrangements currently. So there will be um, a, a, a focus particularly on the market towns and their, and their uh, surrounding areas. There will be um, customer access points throughout North Yorkshire. There will be uh, local governance with local area committees. Uh, there will be what are called community networks. So those will be sort of based around market towns. And a lot of the focus of the devolution work and the economic work is about how we have thriving market towns and how we have a plan on a page to develop each uh, market town. There'll also be new arrangements with town and parish councils, and there's a discussion uh, about having a new town council for Harrogate and a new town council for Scarborough as well. And then in terms of the politics, uh, 90 members uh, in the new council, um, and those 90 members will be elected, as I say, on the 5th of May, and are being elected on, on uh, boundaries that reflect sort of bringing together the pattern of, of borough and district uh, ward boundaries. So something called the Structural Changes Order, which is now uh, through Parliament, um, creates the unitary authority, sets out the elections, sets out the details about uh, electing uh, councillors, and then also gives certain duties to the eight organisations in terms of how we have to work together and prepare for the new council. Important point to be made is that the existing councils remain sovereign. They're the key decision makers until April 2023. Increasingly, though, after the elections, the shadow executive of members will be working with the, the eight leaders uh, to, uh, to, to make sure we manage the business through until uh, vesting day. And the new council will set a budget in February of next year. Uh, as you'd expect, there's uh, a governance arrangement in place. Politically, that's led by uh, the leaders and also executive members. Uh, Councillor Carl Les from North Yorkshire is the chair. Councillor Mark Crane from Selby is the deputy chair. And then we have an officer team, which includes the chief execs and corporate directors as well from the county council. Richard Flinton, the chair. Paul Shevlin uh, from Craven as the deputy. And we're supported by programme teams uh, to do that. As you imagine, it's quite a detailed piece of work. These are the work streams. I'm not going to go through them uh, in massive detail, but Janet, uh, who's here today, is uh, leading on planning. I'm leading on culture, leisure and sport. I think that works, uh, you know, got off well, got off to a good start so far. Um, and we're mindful of the sort of cross-cutting interdependencies between the work that we're doing. Just to look very briefly at some of the implications for the uh, North Yorkshire Health and Wellbeing Board, and I think we have to look at this also in the context of the things that Amanda's going to talk about around ICS uh, reforms and changes. Um, if you look at the recently published integration white paper, which we might want to come back to separately at a future meeting, uh, 
that reaffirms the importance again of the role of the Health and Wellbeing Board as a politically led entity. It also talks a lot about place. And in uh, the ICS arrangements, North Yorkshire is a place. Craven is part of the Bradford and Craven place, but also with a reciprocal uh, arrangement into the rest of North Yorkshire. So an ongoing prominence for health and wellbeing boards. That does mean potentially we have to think about uh, the remit, the, the how we do our business, uh, the membership actually post both the LGR and ICS uh, changes too. There will be a single pot for local government investment that brings all the budgets together for local government in North Yorkshire. And that in some ways mirrors the fact that the ICS has have a single pot uh, for NHS spend and planning too. Very much a variable footprint depending on the business to be undertaken. So as the NHS has primary care networks, uh, local government will have community networks. And in some ways, many of the catchment areas are very similar. So uh, except for the big towns, I, I think we'll see very similar boundaries between PCNs and uh, community networks too. And also they work will work with the local care partnerships uh, between the ICS and local government. Lots of opportunities, I think, around population health and prevention. We've talked about some of that today. Uh, interesting opportunities around devolution and particularly the relationship with York. And one of the issues we may want to think about as a health and wellbeing board going forward is our relationship with our counterparts in York. And are there points where we ever come together to talk about uh, shared issues, particularly in that devolution context? And finally, probably uh, stating the obvious, but I think personally, those of us involved in, in, in the review process feel there are plenty of opportunities to go out longer term over the next you know, three to five years around joining up what we do across housing, leisure, regulatory services, culture, planning, the economy, the list goes on. You know, we're, we're not getting into any detail of that, but there's already quite a lot of good work going on, for example, between social care and housing. I think uh, we've got some examples of a county where there's some really good links between primary and acute care and leisure services. And I think there's more to go at uh, there. So some real opportunities uh, for the future, too. I'm going to pause, if I may, there and just bring in uh, Janet to comment from a, from a district perspective. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank, thank you, Richard, uh, for that that canter through what is a, a complex uh, subject. And change is absolutely nothing uh, out of the ordinary for our partners in health, who seem to be even more experienced in the management of uh, major change on a regular basis than, than we are in local government. So what I wanted to, to really add, uh, and I've said it before, so excuse me for repeating myself, but certainly for members of the board, um, I keep my ear to the ground, as you all do, too. Uh, this change has been managed in a really professional way. Yes, there was a difference of opinion about what the best model would have been, and there were two proposals put forward. But once the decision was made, everybody has accepted that decision and are moving forward together with a spirit of absolute um, desire to get the, the, the best that can possibly be for for our area and, and our patch. So I, I just say that because it's true. Uh, and people are... Uh, feeling um, very um, empowered and enabled to get involved in the change. Just a couple of points. Um, it is taking enormous amount of time and energy to, to, to get this right. And so, of course, there's a risk that we might not be able to do everything we used to do as quickly as we did. We are in a pre-election period now. The notice of election has been uh, set out today. So that means that we will be re restricted in what we do. And I think it's just simply to say to, to, to say to colleagues that um, people are people are just um, there's a little fatigue about because there's so much going on uh, and uh, and I think just being sensitive to that because sometimes uh, we, we're investing a lot in communication but there is a little bit of nervousness about change as, as you could expect and you've experienced but but broadly I think that we're working really really well together pushing in in the right direction. And um, people really do see it as an exciting um, opportunity to to do the things that we've done well before, even better in the future. I think yesterday was the first day we had a really big communication. And I think, Richard, there was over a thousand people attended the um, the, the webinar yesterday, uh, which, which is fantastic. So um, it's really uh, and, and, and thanks, Richard but, and, and, and Michael, it's just to give uh, partners the reassurance that there isn't a a county district vibe, it's simply a, a willingness to just uh, manage this change for the best. 
for, for, for our communities. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Janet. And, and I think you're right to acknowledge the fatigue um, concern there because we have to recognise that that's on the back of everything that people have faced, both personally and professionally, in the last two years. Um, you know, and so so it's it's right to acknowledge it. And it, and I think there's a, a realism about the plans that say first priority is from April of next year that everything works as it should do today. And whilst transformation is absolutely key, how much transformation work is done beforehand and how much is done afterwards will depend on the circumstances of the service, the capacity, everything else. Um, but it's great to hear the, the positive um, comments about how things are how things are shaping up. So thank you for that. Um, open it up to anybody else. Does anybody want to say anything on on this subject? I'm mindful of that slide you put up, Richard, about the future of the Health and Wellbeing Board. I've got a few thoughts I'd probably like to share, but I think I'll wait until Amanda's done her um, uh, ICP slot because I think it's relevant to that. So has anybody got anything they wish to add on this item? If not, um, then I'll go straight. Thanks very much, Richard and Janet. I'll go straight over to Amanda Law then for uh, the Integrated Care Partnership, Integrated Care System uh, uh, developments update. Thanks, Michael. Let's just see if I can make this work. <laughs> the sun is shining on you there, Amanda. So. Oh, is it? Do I look no, like no, it's, it's okay, though. <laughs> Uh, right, just let me. Uh... Yeah, we can see your screen. OK. Do it as slide show. Yeah. yeah. Is that working? Yeah, that's fine. Excellent. OK, so um, good morning, everybody. And I, I hope that most of you uh, know me and I, I'm the accountable officer for North Yorkshire CCG and also had the pleasure for the last um, few years to be Michael's deputy, the vice chair on the North Yorkshire Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, and I'm also the chief operating officer designate for Humber Coast and Vale ICS. And I'm just going to take you through a few slides um, that bring you all up to speed with where we are uh, in terms of ICS development. But I just want to, um, just a couple of things I want to pick up. So just coming back to Janet's point around um, the changes in local government being sort of designed together uh, and working in partnership, that is the same that I'm experiencing with partners in terms of the ICS development. Um, and you know, I think change fatigue is probably good language to use, particularly from an NHS commissioning perspective. But actually, we have to keep coming back to why is the change happening and what is the benefit? Um, and actually, the um, the last two years of COVID probably reframe the necessity to start to think together differently across health and social care and wider system partners to improve population health and reduce health inequalities, to think about the efficiency challenges that we've got across the wider system, and, and also to think in that context of wider social and economic recovery from COVID um, and the partnership and relationships that we've got, I think will stand us in good stead around that. So just in terms of where we are, um, as of today, um, the bill is still planned for the 1st of July 2022. Um, this was obviously delayed um, from April, from the 1st of April. Um, and I know there is some chatter about whether it will be delayed and clearly government are very busy at the moment. But there is a real commitment to get to make this happen because we don't want to extend the uncertainty and the change, particularly for staff. Uh, so the plan date is still the 1st of July um, and our ICS will be working in shadow form from April onwards and actually has been through the last quarter of this year, but we'll move into that shadow form um, operating model. And just picking up the kind of the, the, the segments of the parts of the, um, the ICS and the way it will work, the ICS, the integrated care system, is the wider system. It's all the organisations that make up um, the Humber Coast Novel geography. But the specific parts, the integrated care board, um, this is the NHS board element um, that will be held directly to account for the NHS spend and for performance within the ICS. Um, and that's accountable up to the um, to NHS England. 
And then the Integrated Care Partnership, as Michael referenced, this is a statutory committee, but it's a wider partnership bringing together NHS, local authorities and other partners. And I've got some more detail on that in a further slide. And this thinks, um, I suppose, along the same lines as we've been thinking in the North Yorkshire Health and Wellbeing Board around the wider determinants, around the aspects such as um, housing uh, and the services through the voluntary sector and uh, community investments and how we think more broadly uh, in terms of improvements. The provider collaboratives are uh, partnerships of providers coming together through um, four dimensions. So Sally mentioned the um, primary care collaborative. Also, the acute providers are starting to work together. So Harrogate and, and York with colleagues in Hull and NLAG. Also, the mental health providers and the community providers. Um, and this is key, really, because the challenges that we've got around the waiting lists that have come into being and grown through through the last two years of COVID can only be solved by providers working uh, across geographies and at scale. Um, and the legislation underpinning the ICS gives a duty for all providers to think about the system wide working. So it's moving away from individual silo organisations to genuinely thinking system and thinking about uh, system solutions to the problems. And then lastly, the key part of the changes um, around the place based arrangements and North Yorkshire um, will be a place um, with the exclusion of Craven that sits in the West Yorkshire ICS, but um, Selby, Tadcaster will be part of the North Yorkshire place arrangement. And again, we can come on to that. Um, and there are six places in Humber Coast and Vale ICS, as you can see there. Um, and there will be local decision making um, and there will be subsidiarity in terms of making those decisions as local as possible. So just to whiz through the leadership team, all designate appointments at the moment until the legislation is uh, is passed. But um, this is all available on the website. Um, but as you can see, the exec directors and the two non-executive directors have been appointed. And we're moving on now to the process for the place directors, those six uh, NHS place directors, which will be part of my team um, and key in terms of the success of the delivery of the, um, the ICB strategy. So I do just want to take you through um, some work that's been happening over the last 12 to 18 months, really, and a number of colleagues uh, around this virtual table being involved in this and will recognise it around the values and behaviours of how we operate um, in and amongst um, our system with uh, with all organisations and with our partners and members of the public. Um, it's really clear from engagement with staff, particularly over the last three months, um, as the ICS becomes closer, uh, that staff are keen to involve, be involved in thinking through whether these are, um, whether these need to evolve further. Uh, and we're not going to sit on our laurels. So if actually we need to um, iterate these with our staff, we will do that. Um, but you can see you can see them there on the screen, and I think you would recognise uh, those as being a set of values that we want to work to. Uh, and actually, the emerging vision of the ICS um, is is very recognisable to all of us in North Yorkshire in terms of start well, live well, age well, and end life well, and it aligns perfectly with with our health and wellbeing strategy. And then in terms of the shared purpose, these are the eight P's, um, and again, I think. It, you will recognise all of these as being key. So there is just something about population health and thinking about how we get underneath the data uh, that we're very well aware of in terms of North Yorkshire and what it tells us about our population, but moving upstream to start to prevent ill health and thinking about how we um, get into the prevention agenda rather than being just simply responding to, um, to, to ill health. Um, and so that's that's key. And actually, Sally and colleagues in primary care and then in the um, primary care networks working with uh, Louise and team uh, and actually uh, big parts of the community will be vital in terms of um, embedding that prevention uh, and in engaging with our communities in terms of recognising that around a shared ambition. Um, we've covered off working in partnership and that's partnership with the public as well as uh, inter-organisation. Um, place is uh, important. 
Um, subsidiarity doesn't mean every decision will be delegated to place, um, but what it means is the right decisions will be taken close to the communities that they affect where that's appropriate to do so. And we'll put the right governance and oversight mechanisms that keep us safe, uh, but allow um, work to take place quickly and responsibly. And politics and the public, the local, our local MPs and our local councillor colleagues are critical to this. And um, I know Michael's been really closely involved, as have other colleagues um, from across the political spectrum uh, in terms of moving this forward. And we do need to move quickly. There's a lot of work that we need to do together. And um, so we want a culture that allows us to move quickly. And actually, the arrangements we're putting in place, I think, will support that. Um, and we're all very well aware of the pandemic, which is um, no no means over. Uh, and I can uh, I can attribute to that. That's why the slides are late because it's struck me down as well. Now, um, so actually, we do need to continue to manage our response uh, and be ready to step up to anything that's required of us, uh, but also think about the long term consequences and how we move forward from the pandemic. Um, the ICB, the Integrated Care Board, is the, is the statutory board uh, for NHS uh, funds and performance, as I've mentioned. I want to particularly major on, though, the Integrated Care Partnership, um, which is about wider policy and partnerships um, and thinking about those, um, the integration agenda, the multi-agency, multi multiple partner approach um, and a collective approach to decision making and also thinking about mutual accountability and how we move forward. Um, and the um, the membership of this will be um, it, it'll be far reaching um, and will include uh, councillors from across the six places nominated by the places that may be the health and wellbeing board chairs. It may not be, but that's up to the places and the NHS place directors will be a key part of that conversation as well, as will key um, executives from the ICB, but also key partners from uh, Health Watch to education, academia um, and, and wider community based services. Um, and there will be a real uh, remit for the ICP to set that wider integration and strategic agenda for the ICB and the places to respond to. And Michael may wish to just talk a bit more about this when I've finished. Um, I just want to share this slide with you. And I, I know it's um, I know it's quite busy, um, but it, it actually just helps to frame how we will operate, uh, because I think sometimes conceptualising it is, is difficult. Um, much of the work that will be done will be delivered through the places um, and in partnership with those collaboratives. So our provider colleagues working in a slightly different way, thinking between the boundaries of York and Scarborough FT uh, and Harrogate FT and really thinking um, across the geography about how services are managed and delivered for the benefit of the population. Um, and the Integrated Care Board and the Integrated Care Partnership obviously working really, really closely together. And from a governance perspective, the Integrated Care Board will set up the relevant statutory uh, committees and delivery uh, vehicles that it needs to do. Just in terms of the North Yorkshire place, you can see there's an asterisk there. Um, that is obviously because North Yorkshire is, uh, is special, um, but is because North Yorkshire is big. Um, it's big with a number of uh, significant market towns um, and there will be a different um, set of operating um, arrangements in North Yorkshire. And we've been working with all our partners in primary care, in communities, in the VCS, in the providers uh, and local authority. And uh, Richard Webb's been key in leading this work with Wendy Balmain over the last few months uh, around how those local care partnerships will work. Um, and we've had a number of workshops in each of the, the four local care partnerships um, chaired by Wendy and Richard to think about um, how we're going to operate under that North Yorkshire place umbrella, but recognising that one end of North Yorkshire looks very different uh, to the other. So there will be four local care partnerships. Craven is obviously, um, as I've said before, uh, an important part of the North Yorkshire County Council geography, uh, but not within the Humber Coast and Vale geography. Um, so thinking about Harrogate, Hambleton, Richmondshire, um, the East Coast Corridor and Vale and Selby. And then underneath that, the primary care networks, 
and how our GP practices and our wider primary care colleagues, so our, our dental colleagues, community pharmacies and optometrists fit into that uh, in terms of those voices. And then lastly, just wanted to reflect back some of the feedback that we've had from those conversations in the local care partnerships around what's important um, and how do we, um, I guess, learn from um, the work that we've done through being um, the CCGs across North Yorkshire and then more recently the North Yorkshire CCG and take all of that learning forwards but embrace the kind of the, the new policy and move forwards and what's really interesting for me is that there's a real appetite to think and work differently together and coalesce around a single integrated vision and plan um, but there's a there's a recognition that there needs to be an element of permission and trust to get on and do and the arrangements we're putting in place I really hope will enshrine that um, and we actually share uh, in terms of our concerns and what the priorities are for us um, we share those four things around we've got to upstream shift into prevention we can't keep responding to ill health although we will always be there when people need us um, there is something around inequalities and particularly the inequalities that have been driven um, driven and made worse uh, and are not seen through the impact of COVID. Um, how do we break down those barriers between um, agencies and workforce uh, to get into a collaborative workforce model um, and work across organisations? I think members of the public often don't care which organisation provides care, it needs to be seamless and joined up and responsive. And that's where we want to get to. Um, and picking up Ashley's point around some of the challenges we've seen in dentistry and in uh, primary care, one of our biggest challenges is workforce. One of our biggest challenges at the moment is workforce. Um, and so that's a key priority for us all. And I'm going to close there, Michael, thank you. Thanks, thanks Amanda. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting, but when, when you look at a lot of what you've talked about there, some of the things that Louise focused on in her Director of Public Health Annual Report, it's recognising that, that North Yorkshire as a place, part of what makes it so special is it's so diverse. Geographically, it's, it's so diverse. And therefore, there is, when you look at things like health and social care, there is, there is differences in in it, we, we talked earlier about the, the the differences in the life expectancy across across the county, um, and so whilst we'll have a single vision and a plan within that, it's recognising that it's not one size fits all. It must be very different doing a doing a uh, d delivering something like this if you were in Leeds or or if you're in 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 Bradford. You know, if you if, if you've got a dentistry problem in 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 Leeds. You know that one part of Leeds has a problem. Well, you just hop on a bus and go to another part of Leeds. You know that that's just yeah. not the case in and in North Yorkshire. I think that's right, and and I think uh, there is something really powerful about thinking about the opportunities that that brings, because the depth of learning and experience across our geography, both um, from our service users in our communities and from the the, the clinic, the service providers. Um, it's huge. So actually, some of the innovation we've seen that we can share across one part of North Yorkshire to another, and also not not forgetting that bet there are some some synergies and similarities. It's just that the distance is so much bigger. Um, but I think I I also think um, that the strength of the relationships that we've got um, in that we can pull together and work together. But if there is a difference of opinion where we can comfortably share and express that and work to a solution um, stands us in, in good stead as we move forward. And, and on top of that, we, we're always mindful that um, Bradford uh, and, and Craven, with the, the Craven part of our county, is, is facing into a different ICS. That, that actually reflects the fact that we, we are so big that sometimes a line on a map doesn't doesn't reflect you know people's lives and yeah, people movements absolutely. and resources and, and so it's right that that uh, Craven faces somewhere else but but that doesn't mean that it's forgotten one thing I wanted to raise is really where this this health and well-being board fits in because clearly the ICS more widely or both ICSs are going to have their own strategy a health the health and well-being board needs 
the strategy and our strategy needs up, updating. That's something that we'll we'll come on to in in the next sort of cycle of the of the of the board. Clearly, the the need to align, and we will have representation, as you've mentioned, politically at at the Integrated Care Partnership. Um, we've we've you know we've got ICB, ICP, place boards, health and wellbeing boards. Never mind. Um, scrutiny and I'm just conscious that whatever we or wherever we land I, I want to reassure people that, that we don't want individuals who are representing a, a sector or, or an organization to have to sit in in different meetings of, of different boards talking about the same thing looking at the same reports because that serves no purpose whatsoever so I think this this board as the ICS develops this health and wellbeing board will have to change to make sure that that we we do what we need to do we have the right representation but that we also don't waste people's time um and yeah and I, think I absolutely that, agree yeah. yeah yeah I agree and I think you know that um the, the challenges that we face are not so radically different um, that the strategy is going to look completely different. What we do need to do is um, identify the big things we've got to deliver, but there will be flexibility in terms of if there's something really um, important for, say, Hamilton and Richmondshire that needs addressing, that they get on with that. But that might look different to a, a, a particular challenge that there is on the East Coast. So there's the flexibility for that. But I, I think there will be a lot of alignment between the work and, you know, the fact that the, um, you know, age well, live well, die well strategy aligns with North Yorkshire, um, you know, that with our joint health and wellbeing strategy. They're not good. They're, pro they're going to converge rather than diverge, I think. Um, and if we need one conversation, we, we should only have one conversation yeah. and one document actually moving forward. So that would be real integration, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. OK, and anyone want to um, add anything on this on this topic? No. OK, in with oh, Ashley, yeah, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Amanda. That, that was really um, in, insightful. And, and I suppose it's, it's, it's comments, really, that I think I think sometimes NHS changes can be um, um, <laughs> not always welcome. But I, th I think this this is a, um, a, a positive and particularly around what you spoke about, you know, thinking about the wider um, determinants of health. So make sure we're linking in you know, the NHS and local authorities and social care, but looking at things like, you know, transport, housing, the environment. So I think I, I, I welcome it. And I'm, I'm really pleased and thank you for the involvement of, of Health Watch because we're really keen to um, participate. And I suppose that, I suppose a question or, or, or whether you, you foresee it could be a challenge, but I know we're all very passionate here about North Yorkshire. In the bigger picture, where if you think about the whole, I suppose, the whole system and you've got areas like East Riding and you've got Hull, which are, I suppose, we're supposed to be done no, no, notorious for their health inequalities. Could there be a challenge that, that, that funding might go more towards them because, because of those issues? And how do we ensure that we have the, the right funding services that covers North, North Yorkshire? Um, and, and if, but I mean, could it could it be could it be a concern or or or, or not? Hopefully, hopefully it won't wouldn't be. I, I think I mean I think it would be wrong to say that um, actually the 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 funding settlements and the efficiency challenges that we've got across the NHS and and the care sector at the moment are not a concern and a challenge because I, I think that the impact on health inequalities from COVID has been huge and I think the difficulty that I would see is that where there have been real challenges and inequalities they've actually got worse uh, rather than better over the last two years so you know places like Hull that have significant inequalities if you look at the difference in life expectancy between Hull and North Yorkshire you yeah, know they will have got worse but actually we've still got to make sure that we support services across all of the geography that includes the population of North Yorkshire. I think we'll need to have sensible conversations and we'll need to be clear on the priorities. But I think that the place model and the fact that actually a lot of the money comes in to local places to provide service and therefore has a cost attached to it um, allows us to have a level of confidence moving forwards, Ashley. Um, but I think that's where the relationships and understanding what the data tells us about our population needs and getting upstream around prevention are so important. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, great. Uh, no one else's hand is up, so that's great. Amanda, thank you very much for for that. Um, no we'll, thank you. We'll, we'll move on to item now, uh, item nine now, which is North Yorkshire Better Care Fund for 2021-22, and handing over to Louise. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, the next three items on the agenda actually are bits of business that are part of the Health and Wellbeing Board's um, uh, duties, I guess. And um, so the Bit Better Care Fund, which of course has been there for several years now, which is there to really encourage integration, is, is one of those items that um, board members will have seen previously. So it is brought today really for information, just so that um, uh, members hopefully can be assured about where this uh, fund is and how it's been invested. So what we've got in terms of the papers is the uh, narrative, uh, summary narrative that went in as part of our Better Care Fund submission uh, for our plan. And we've got 59 projects with a total of 75.5 million. I, I wasn't intending to go through all of the detail of the report because it is there for information. Uh, but I guess just in terms of um, assurance that the Better Care Fund is being used as it is meant to be used, which is to ensure integration across health and social care, um, that um, obviously clearly this has been in the context of the pandemic. Um, but I just wondered, Chairman, if... if um, if Sean Jones is still on the line, if jo Sean wanted to make a particular comment, because we do um, send the Better Care Fund submission up through NHS England, and it is indeed um, through our routes uh, regionally and nationally that the fund gets agreed, uh, but it has absolutely been done in partnership. And I suspect Amanda might want to come in because this is a joint arrangement across both um, the local authority and um, the NHS. So I'll just pause there in case. Uh, those two I, think Sean, I think Sean's, Sean's gone. gone. Okay. I think he had to drop out into a call. I mean, I I, I wouldn't have anything else um, to, to to add, Louise. I mean, I I think again, it's a, it's a good example of um, you know where we're where we're getting on with things together and um, moving things forward. I suppose the only concern for me, um, whenever we've talked about Better Care Fund, is and correct me, Louise, if I'm getting this wrong, but I've always felt that. Whilst government appears committed to continuing to fund using the Better Care Fund, we end up with a disparate set of funding streams that um, are, are bundled together that we use as effectively as we can, but don't necessarily allow us to make long term strategic decisions if the funding is time bound and we don't know whether it's going to continue beyond. Now, I, I'm sure I saw something recently that confirmed that government intended still to use the BCF. Do we still have that challenge that we, we, we're constrained somewhat by by the limitations on the on the, the different threads of funding and the timing? So there's a commitment to integration, absolutely. But what I'm going to do, if I can, share is hand to Richard, because yep. I think Richard's probably a um, better place to answer from an overall financial resource point of view. Uh, thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, th I think there are uh, issues with multiple and fragmented funding. I mean, I think probably perhaps less. Uh, there are different challenges for the NHS. I think for local government, uh, we've got money coming from seven or eight different routes into some of the areas covered by the BCF, some of which are national, some of which are local, some of which are via charging and some of which are uh, uh, via the uh, NHS. Also, you've got improved, you know, improved better care fund, the better care fund, which makes it confusing. The integration white paper does talk about the better care fund being the significant uh, funding vehicle, investment vehicle for the NHS and, and local government working together in the future. So it seems to be reaffirmed. So there may be an issue, just as you're saying, for the Health and Wellbeing Board about maybe we need to, with Amanda's team, look at if that is going to be the longer term funding route, what does that look like and how do we give some, try and have a sort of almost medium term strategy around the finances for that. that that's probably easier to do actually with the strength of the ICS and the sort of single pot for the NHS and then a single pot for local government with LGR. Yeah. Okay, right. Okay, thank you. No one else's hand is up, so Louise, um, go straight on to um, item 10, the um, pharmaceutical needs assessment. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. And again, just um, to remind members of this board that this is a duty of us as the Health and Wellbeing Board to make sure that the pharmaceutical needs assessment is undertaken. Um, it's usually undertaken on a three-year cycle. And as you'll see from the paper, we're actually working with colleagues in the City of York to um, ensure that we get the pharmaceutical needs assessment done. And it is a really important um, piece of work to inform um, pharmacy provision, but it also identifies um, 
lots of different needs, I think, through that whole pharmaceutical needs assessment process. So we've just um, uh, commissioned a provider to, to provide us with um, the expertise to develop the pharmaceutical needs assessment. And as you'll see under Section 3, that um, is the North East Commissioning Support Unit, at which we're uh, really pleased that we've managed to secure support to ensure that this is delivered. Um, hopefully colleagues will see um, information out there in the uh, kind of media um, around the pharmaceutical needs assessment taking place because we're trying to encourage community engagement. It's really important that we do hear the voices and views of people. So there are several surveys underway, um, three separate surveys there for residents, pharmacies and stakeholders to, to feed in. Um, and so hopefully um, there'll be uh, quite a, a visible presence around this over the next few weeks to try and encourage people to respond and to get in touch because um, really the quality of the information we receive and the engagement that we have will help to inform um, the needs assessment. Um, we'll be looking to bring the needs assessment back, obviously, to the Health and Wellbeing Board uh, once the piece of work is completed. And it will be used um, to inform the Health and Wellbeing Strategy, which is, of course, the next item that we're coming on to. But um, really timely and important that we refresh this so we understand uh, where pharmaceutical needs are across the county and um, the current provision. OK, thank you. I suppose that the plea to the wider board is to be aware that this is going on to try and publish, um, publicise this as much as possible to, to relevant people to, to get a response to any any consultation. OK, thank you. Um, if there's no one putting their hand up, then we'll roll straight into item 11, the um, North Yorkshire Joint Strategic Needs Assessment and Strategy. Yes, thank you. And I think we've alluded to, to this um, throughout the, the meeting, Chairman, about the need for a refresh of the health and wellbeing strategy. And of course, the strategy needs to be informed by um, both qualitative and quantitative need assessment. And for um, us as a health and wellbeing board, again, our duty is to ensure that a joint strategic needs assessment is undertaken. And um, that's not an annual thing. That's an ever evolving and iterative process around understanding need and um, sometimes we go into sort of subject specific areas um, or we look at the kind of local health profile of the population. So we do have a wealth of data and intelligence, I think, across organisations, but we do need to keep it up to date and ensure that it is used, the data that we have and the intelligence that we have to inform the development of our joint health and wellbeing strategy. But as we've discussed this morning, it is now timely to review and refresh. And um, in the light of all the organisation and context changes that we've, we're, we're going through, um, so we're proposing that we start that process to have the health and wellbeing strategy, having uh, special sessions, ensuring that we engage people in trying to draft the strategy, um, but just to signal that that work does need to be done and that um, there'll be a group of us uh, going away from this meeting and starting that process and ensuring that um, people have an opportunity to contribute and shape in the light of the priorities and indeed, hopefully in the light of the context of the conversation we've had this morning with the annual report, my, my annual report, with the uh, presentation that Amanda's given and of course, in the context of local government review. Um, so yeah, just to, to, to make sure members are aware, we're going to start that work subject to agreement with the board. Um, it is one of our duties and it will be informed from the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment. And, and so when when would, so so this board would approve it, presumably, and so when when would you see the timescales for that being? So we need to, to map that out in greater detail, but I would see it um, probably by the shortly after Christmas. I mean, I'm committing to that in um, a very kind of indicative sense no, this that, morning, but yeah. I think that probably feels about right for the board to certainly have a first good draft or a almost complete draft to look at and to, to be sure that we're in the right direction and ready to kind of go live by March 2023, unless Amanda and Richard Webb feel differently. I think we probably would work to that timescale. And, and so just trying to understand, because we talked earlier about that, that I mean, and this this report mentions that this strategy is in effect embedded within place, um, but it's also our place is part of a wider um, ICS structure of which that I, ICS will have a strategy um, that is. Let me get this right. The integrated care partnership ultimately would would approve. So how do we make sure that our place? based strategy that this health and wellbeing board does along with the other is it another five or so health and wellbeing boards in 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 the ICS how they they align or at least not in conflict with the the wider ICS strategy and Amanda you've got your hand up because I think you'll have the if there's an answer that we can so have. 
I don't have the exact answer to that very good question, um, but I think that we just need to recognise we need to make this as straightforward and as integrated as possible. Um, so, you know, North Yorkshire will have to have uh, a health and wellbeing strategy, but actually given the emerging uh, ICP and the overarching integrated strategy that it will oversee, it's entirely possible that that has a, a set of strategic intent for the ICS and then is made up of a set of chapters around the places with some golden threads between them that align with the health and wellbeing strategy of North Yorkshire. So actually it comes back to the point of not duplicating. If we've got six health and wellbeing strategies, there will be a huge amount of similarity between the six of them, and there'll be some very, very local priorities based on population need. And we could use those to frame the wider ICP strategy. That, for me, would be the best way to do it. So I, I think we'll use all of all of our partners on the ICP and pragmatism will apply to make sure we've got a document that's fit for purpose and reflects what the population need. OK, OK, thank you. Anything anybody else wants to say on this subject? Uh, just to, just another comments from Richard in the box about needing it to be published. So in terms of what I broadly committed to there to bring a draft um, to this uh, committee, certainly by end of the year into January, I think that probably feels um, timely in terms of a very good draft and um, keep the board uh, appraised of progress until that time, if that's OK, Chairman. Yep. OK, that's that's good. Thank you. Right, OK, um, in which case we'll move on to uh, nearly through the agenda now, actually. So um, item 12 is the rolling work programme that's been circulated with the agenda. It's just for noting. Patrick, have you got anything that you want to say at this point on that? Thank you, Chair. Just very briefly, um, it's a fluid document because naturally circumstances change, new initiatives arise. Our timetabled matters in that I know yourselves need to approve as a board, such as the Pharmaceutical Needs Assessment Better Care Fund and Louise has referred to Joint Health and Wellbeing Strategy. Um, but it's important to note that the work programme is actually owned by the, by the board. So if any member has any items that they feel need to be included, if they could sort of advise that now or any time between the meetings, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you. A couple of things for me just to highlight on there. First of all, membership. Um, so the, ne the next meeting scheduled for May. So membership will be necessary there. I think um, with Steve Russell moving off on long term secondment, I think we'll need to look at um, replacing Steve as member of this board. Um, also, from a political perspective, there are, as was mentioned in Richard's LGR update, there is elections to the new council on 5th of May and the uh, my position as uh, Health and Wellbeing Board Chair would be impacted um, potentially as part of that. So um, we'll probably, Patrick will probably come out to individuals directly if there's a, a new nomination needed from any of our uh, partners from a membership perspective and then also if I can just um, highlight the scheduled meeting in July uh, we've put on their um, review of health and well-being board um, to look at things like terms of reference and how we operate I think that goes back to what I was saying before um, in terms of how we align into the various ICS um, forums to make sure that we're making the best use of meeting our obligations, making best use of people's time. If you find that you have to attend uh, the same things, we want, to, we want to make sure that we don't duplicate. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind. But as Patrick says, it is a fluid document. OK. Um, other than that, item 13, other business to be considered as a matter of urgency, there isn't any. Item 14, next meeting is 25th of May. I don't, uh, th this this meeting now is actually the last one in the in the current county council cycle. We should have had four years, but we got five because elections were delayed. So um, this, depending on uh, the outcome of elections and appointments, this could well be my last meeting as chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. I, I, I don't know. I'll know more in May if it is. Thank you all very much for your support. If it's not, I look forward to seeing you all in May. OK, so uh, if, if that's that, I'll bring this meeting to a close and thank you all for attending. Richard, you've just got your hand up.
I think I'm just going to try and sneak in there, Michael, because I think on behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank you for your leadership of the board over the last five years. I think uh, part of what Amanda and Louise were talking about earlier, about how we've moved on as a really strong uh, formation in North Yorkshire, and, and that's been partly uh, significantly through the leadership that we've had uh, from the Health and Wellbeing Board and the way that we do business here as well. And we take that into other situations as well. So I wanted to thank you on behalf of all of us and other uh, colleagues who've, who've been part of this over the last five years. That's very kind of you to say, Richard. Thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. Bring the meeting to a close. Thank you.